Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to tell you about something a very long way away. It's not in near Earth orbit. It's um, literally trillions of light years away. Um, well, actually, not billions, sorry. Um, and it's about a neutron star merger. So what's a neutron star? What's a merger? Um, why are we doing it? Well, this all began with um, our understanding of physics. And Johannes Kepler in the 1600s realized that you could describe the motions of the planets with his three laws about how long they took to go around the sun, how it was related to how far away they are, how fast they went in different parts of their orbits, and, and how they went in elliptical orbits. Um, Isaac Newton came along about 100 years later and showed that there were just a very simple couple of postulates plus the invention of integral and differential calculus that meant that you could explain Kepler's laws, which were just sort of mathematical um, observations of, of the universe, um, using um, his universal law of gravitation and also the fact that a mass would accelerate due to a force. Einstein came along a couple of hundred years later and realized that you can't actually tell when you're falling in a gravitational field and that clocks tick faster if they're in outer space than they do on the Earth, and that if you can compress an object like the Earth down to about a centimetre across, it would actually become a black hole. And a black hole is an object so dense that not even light can escape it. But was this all the thing, uh, part, the story of science fiction, or was this a reality? Um, the last thing in, in Einstein's general theory of relativity was a, a postulate that whenever two masses are accelerated near each other, they give off gravitational waves and space-time fundamentally shakes. And he calculated carefully how big this shaking of space-time would be and realised it would never be possible to detect it. And so it was nothing more than an academic curiosity. But that was before the invention of quantum optics, before the laser, um, before atomic clocks and quantum mechanics. And so if we fast forward um, another 100 years um, and we see how big the Earth is compared to things in the universe, there's the sun there. Um, that blue thing is, is called a supergiant. It's 10 times the mass of the sun, which is 300,000 times heavier than the Earth. And you can fit about a million Earths inside the sun. And in the centres of these gigantic stars, which are 10 times heavier than our sun, there's a massive chemical factory in the core. And these chemical factories are combining hydrogen and, and helium into elements like carbon and ultimately to iron. And when the core of one of these stars becomes about the size of the Earth, it weighs a half a million times as much as the Earth, and it ca causes all the electrons and protons to be combined into neutrons, they lose their inter atomic repulsion, and the thing collapses in less than a second in what's called a supernova explosion, and it blows up the star, and you're left with this magical thing called a pulsar. So this is a neutron star, one cc is a billion tons. Uh, these are incredible objects, half a million times more heavy than the Earth, only 20 kilometres across. I'm delighted to say they were discovered by a woman by the name of Jocelyn Bell back in 1967, and we had the big 50th birthday celebration last year, and she was given $3 million this year uh, for her role in that, if not the Nobel Prize. Um, so these things were not known about when, when Einstein was doing his postulates, but if you can get two massive stars going around each other, one of them, when it ends its life, will swell up into a giant and leave behind one of these pulsars, and if you get a, a system that has two really heavy stars, the second star will also swell up and it'll blow up. And then you've got two things which are 10 kilometres in radius going around each other every few hours and giving off gravitational waves. And the gravitational waves remove energy from the orbit and that makes the orbit shrink. And then it gives off more gravitational waves and it causes them to shrink a bit more. And they go into this death spiral. And after a few million years, they actually get to the point where they're touching and they give off this amazing burst of gravitational waves. And so the idea was, if we could build a detector, maybe we could see these things. So the advanced LIGO project um, was conceived um, in America um, over 30 years ago. And the idea is you get a sort of James Bond-style laser, and you fire at a beam splitter. You send one, in, one um, 
half of the energy down one vacuum tube and the other half down another. They're at right angles. They travel along four kilometres. They bounce off a mirror, beautifully polished by the CSIRO, I might add. It comes back, and if a gravitational wave passes through the Earth, these, these arms will shake as the gravitational wave goes through, but they'll only shake by about one part in 10 to the 21, which is not a very big number. That's about the width of a human hair at Alpha Centauri. So it's a very, very tiny thing. Another way of putting it is that the mirror should move by one ten thousandth of the width of a proton, and protons are very tiny. Nevertheless, Congress gave them the several hundred million dollars to build this thing, and they turned it on, and while they were still testing it, um, so this is the device, there's my laser beam, the real one's a little bit more complicated than this. Um, but as they turned it on and were testing it, two black holes, which I haven't told you about yet, actually about 400 uh, million parsecs away, there's about a billion light years, were actually going around each other and they're in the last few orbits of their lifetime and they go off this amazing burst of gravitational waves. So even though this system was designed to find two neutron stars annihilating each other, they actually found two black holes, and it was the first time we actually knew that 30 solar mass black holes existed. They're about 100 kilometres in radius, and we witnessed the last quarter of a second of these two black holes going around each other, and I think they were going around each other about 400 times a second in the last few cycles. Anyway, a burst of gravitational waves came through. Nobel Prize was awarded last year for this remarkable discovery. But the thing that LIGO had been built for, which was discovering these neutron stars, hadn't occurred yet. And we kept finding other black holes merging. They're almost getting boring. Um, here's a, what a, a gravitational wave looks like. You can see the amplitude of the gravitational wave gets larger as they get closer and closer to their death spiral. The amplitude of the gravitational wave gets bigger and bigger. And this was what the Nobel Prize was awarded for. Um, this is what two black holes going around each other would look like. The light as it goes past the black hole actually bends the light. And this was done by the same people who did the interstellar movie. Um, but this is kind of real. And then on the 17th of August uh, 2017, um, we saw two neutron stars going around each other. It was 130 million light years away. The two neutron stars, we saw the last two minutes of their lifetime. These things had been going around each other for something like a billion years. And as they got closer and closer together, they were actually going around each other a thousand times a second just before they, they broke up. We actually saw the last 4,000 orbits in the last two minutes of their lifetime. And this gravitational wave ran through the Earth. The little LIGO detectors did their thing. And then one and a half seconds later, um, the Fermi satellite received a burst of gamma rays. Uh, every astronomer on the planet went to their nearest telescope, and a telescope in Chile managed to see a new star that appeared for just a few days in the sky. And our colleagues in Australia and here in Western Australia, David Coward and his team, managed to see the, what's called the kilonova, um, which resulted. So. We have a catalogue of galaxies. Galaxies have about 100 billion stars in them, and we're able to pinpoint which of these galaxies the neutron stars merged in. This is a map of all the galaxies that we know of in the, in the sort of southern hemisphere. So we could localise it to an, an old, what we call red and dead galaxy, where not many stars are still being born. So this was a sort of a time bomb with a few billion year old fuse. Um, this is what the gravitational wave looked like. There's a little graph there on the, on the x-axis there is time, and on the y-axis is how fast the neutron stars are going around each other. This agreed perfectly with Einstein's prediction. And then there was this like 1.7 second gap, and then this burst of gamma rays whacked into the Earth. Um, and so the gamma rays were formed when the two neutron stars ripped each other apart. There was something like um, the equivalent of 10 to the 30 atomic bombs worth of energy given off in that time. It was one of the most energetic events we've ever seen. And we could see the, the new star which um, formed, it's that little arrow with the yellow dot outside this um, elliptical galaxy. So what does this all mean? Well, there were four major science outcomes of this event. Um, first of all, we could measure the speed of gravitational waves and the speed of light and see if they were the same. And they agreed to 1.7 seconds, 
over the course of a 120 million year um, journey. So the gravitational waves and the light probably are traveling at the same speed. That's kind of a relief because that was part of the central prediction of Einstein. We could measure from the amplitude of the gravitational wave how far away this thing was. And by looking at the, what we call the redshift of the galaxy, how far it's traveling away from us, we could measure the expansion rate of the universe. Um, we discovered that whenever two neutron stars smash into each other, you get a burst of gamma rays. And gamma ray bursts were first discovered in the 1960s, but we weren't 100% sure what gave rise to what's called the short duration gamma ray bursts. And we have this new type of star in the universe that only lasts for a few days. It's actually the afterglow of the neutron star merger. Anyway, so that's my story. Um, it involved over a thousand astronomers around the world to build this amazing detector, which is the most accurate, not only earthquake detector, but also gravitational wave detector in the universe. And it fulfilled Einstein's vision that, or, and prediction that these massive events in the universe should give rise to gravitational waves. So thank you very much.